So uh, welcome everyone to my talk. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, so I don't really have a title. Um, it's sort of a grab bag. So I originally, so the reason I, I started or wanted to do a talk is because I started implementing some stuff from linear logic in Lean and I wanted to share that. But then I started writing out the talk and like going through introducing linear logic and then I discovered that if you don't really know what like sequent calculus is and that sort of thing, then it doesn't really make sense to start with linear logic. So I guess the first question is how many of you have seen sequent calculus style of proofs? So not so many, that's good because, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm gonna kind of start with the, um, how many people know about the Curry-Howard correspondence? Okay, so. Oh no, the Curry-Howard. like with the lambda calculus and the, uh, no, I mean, it's like implicit in the propositions as types thing, but it's not necessarily, uh, uh, yeah, we didn't really like go over it in detail. So kind of what I'm going to do today is kind of explore that, introduce sequent calculus for classical logic and intuitionistic logic, and then sort of based on that, I'll show how you can amend this sort of thing to get linear logic. Um, yeah, and based on... Um, how long that goes, I'll do it in more or less detail. And after in the second part, I'll like introduce uh, inductive types in Lean, which is something we haven't yet seen, uh, which is important because you want to kind of program your own types most of the time. And I'll kind of show with some programming examples how to do that. It's not very difficult and it's very similar, like the syntax is very similar to other functional programming languages. Um, yeah, and maybe in the end, I'll maybe show you what I did with the linear logic, but uh, that only really makes sense if we get through the preliminary stuff. Okay, so sort of the, I don't know, outline or the sort of the main sort of or orienting guide is this correspondence between, uh, between logic, uh, between, I guess, categories or some form of pre-order um, and uh, computation on this side. And so we'll be sort of navigating this triangle around in this direction in the first part of the talk. And so basically I want to start with kind of thinking again about these questions we, were, we encountered when we defined types in the type theory, sort of this distinction between definitional equality and propositional equality and what it even means to mean, uh, say that some statement holds. So kind of the first idea is to ask, well, what does it really mean if we say things like, three plus three is equal to six, or maybe we state some proposition P, namely uh, there are infinitely many primes. So kind of the question is what, what do we mean when we say that these statements hold? And so one, one answer to this, which is sort of the standard thing you learn in the first year of your bachelor's is that is sort of the definite, uh, sorry, it's called denotational um, answer. So that's like denotation. So which, which answers this question is saying that, well, basically three plus three is just another natural number and it denotes the same natural number as six. So this equality statement here means that these two objects are like literally equal. And in a, in a similar fashion in logic, if we have some true proposition, the denotational answer is that this proposition here is literally the same object as true, like the proposition that's always true. But somehow this answer with, you know, saying that these two things are literally the same is maybe not really getting at what we mean when we write these sort of things. Because if these things were obviously the same, we wouldn't feel, like, feel that it's necessary to make this statement. So this statement is actually telling you something else, namely that you know, if you, you can perform a computation on uh, this uh, expression here and get an answer six, and those are equal. But if it was just like by definition that these were equal, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't really need to talk about it. And similarly for um, logical propositions, I mean, if you, if you just think about all true theorems as denoting true, then sort of doing math becomes kind of pointless because then mathematicians would just be walking around saying things like yellow is yellow and blue is blue. And we, we kind of know that we're doing more when we're proving a statement like there are infinitely many primes than just proving true again in a different fashion. 
And so this has to do with um, also with thinking about what implication actually means. So in, in standard logic, or like in the sort of high school logic where you define implementation through uh, implication through uh, truth tables, there doesn't really have to be any connection between your premises and between your conclusions. So it's just kind of a statement that, well, your premises are either false and your conclusions true, uh, or, or your conclusions are anything, or your premises are true and your conclusions are true. But there isn't really a connection. But when we prove that there are infin uh, infinitely many primes, then we're actually like, doing something in the, pr in the proof which has to do with primes. So another answer, aside from this denotation answer here, would be um, to say that, so maybe a better answer um, is that, you know, we can, form a uh, we can perform a computation um, that turns this expression 3 plus 3 into 6. That would be maybe for the first one. What does it mean for this equality to hold? And the second one would be maybe something like we can give a proof. We can give a proof um, um, of this proposition P. And well, in the proof, there'll be some computational content like about, about primes and such. So in that case, we're not just talking about sort of tautologically true statements. And this kind of leads to this uh, BHK interpretation of of logic, so this stands for Bauer, Heiting, and Kolmogorov, and so um, this interprets logical connectives and what it means for statements to hold, um, sort of in this in this vein. So well, that's a bit skew. So in logic, we might have statements like uh, the statement P holds, and then the BHK interpretation for this would be that we can give a proof of P. Okay, and then we can uh, sort of extend this interpretation to logical connectives. So what would it mean for P and Q to hold? Well, in this case, we give a proof of both P and Q. Um, then there's the disjunction, so P or Q holds if we can give a proof of, well, either P or Q or both. But here it's important that we actually have a proof of one of them at least. And then we can think about what implication means. Let's say this implication holds if, well, given the proof of P, Um, we can produce uh, can produce a proof of Q. So if we have an arbitrary proof of P, then we need to be able to convert this into a proof of Q. And that's what uh, P implies Q means under this BHK interpretation. And finally, negation, so not P, holds if if, well, if we suppose that we have a proof of P, that this leads to a contradiction. So we could say if we can show that, um, well, having a proof or show that proving P leads to a contradiction. Okay. So that's uh, sort of intuitively what we could interpret these connectives as well, under this BHK interpretation. And so one thing we can notice is that, uh, well, I guess here I should say that th this is equivalent to saying that P implies uh, false under this interpretation. So if we have a proof of P, we can always produce a contradiction or, well, a proof of this bottom element false would be a contradiction. Okay, so, uh, hmm? well, it's, I guess this would be like the empty, I mean, it's like the empty set. It's like if you can produce a function from your set to the empty set, then your, the starting set would have to be empty. This is a formal like bottom element, which you would put in your, I mean, this is really, this is like not formal yet. So it, that, I haven't defined this yet and I haven't defined what P and Q are. So, but uh, I think this would just be the symbol for like, some proposition which is never true. I don't know. 
if, if you put it, if you put these things in a pre-order, it would be your bottom element, I guess. Basically, if 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 you have something like this into, well, then p would be isomorphic to your bottom element, and then like everything collapses. So it's like. Yeah. No, it's not really a contradiction, but then your logic is trivial, I guess. Sh sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this, so basically, this is like the this is just an idea, and then you build logic based on this, and what it will lead to is intuitionistic logic, which is sort of the constructive logic that uh, is. Well, similar to what happens in type theory. OK, so one thing we can observe here, because I already said constructive, is that, well, so two things we can note is that, so on the one hand, under this interpretation, A implies not not A. So if I have a proof of A, then it would be contradictory to assume that a proof of A leads to a contradiction. So this, this holds in this sort of way of thinking. But on the other hand, uh, this doesn't necessarily hold. So that not not A implies A. This is just saying that it would be contradictory to assume that any proof of A leads to a contradiction, but that doesn't give you a way of producing a proof of A. So yeah, I guess that's. Anyway, so this is just saying that we don't have this uh, double negation law. And also, we don't necessarily, under this interpretation, have the law of the excluded middle. Um, because the law of the excluded middle is saying that either we can produce a proof of A or we can produce uh, a proof that a proof of A would lead to a contradiction. But it could be that neither of these happens. Okay, so basically this shows that this type of logic is basically, well, this intuitionistic logic. And well, one way of um, One way of defining intuitionistic logic is taking all the axioms like in a Hilbert style system of classical logic and just leaving out the law of the excluded middle or double negation, depending on how you axiomatize it. So probably people here have seen like Hilbert style uh, logical systems. So there you basically just, you have very few rules. You just have modus ponens and maybe generalization and maybe some substitution rule. And then you encode all of your logic in axioms. So like in the Hilbert uh, system for classical logic, you have 12 axioms, which basically give you all your logical rules. And then you can sort of formally prove things with that. And there you can, can get intuitionistic logic from classical logic by just leaving out these, these axioms of the excluded middle. OK, so basically the idea is now to make this more formal. And well, I've already mentioned, uh, mentioned these Hilbert style systems. The disadvantage or the advantage of using these Hilbert style systems is that you have very few rules. So when you do proofs about proof theory, you have to usually do induction on the rules you're using. And because you have very few rules in the Hilbert style system, it means that your induction is easy because you just have to like show two things in your inductive step. Um, but working with the Hilbert style system is really a nightmare. If you've ever uh, tried to prove anything basic with these axioms and doing it, it's, it's terrible. So the, the nicest thing to do is uh, natural deduction, which is a system for classical logic and also works for intuitionistic logic, where you can kind of uh, argument like you would do informally in proofs. But uh, basically, the types of logic that admit natural deduction are very restricted. So the most general, actually, form of formal system, which covers l many logics, is this uh, what's called sequent calculus, which I'm going to introduce now. And I'm going to build up the sequent calculus for uh, classical and intuitionistic logic. And the advantage of the sequent calculus is that it makes uh, sort of symmetries in your proof theory very apparent. And also, um, it's, it's all right to work with. And yeah, it's, it's basically good for doing proof theory. And it basically allows you to express a lot of different types of logic. OK, so for this, I need to introduce some notation. So I'm not going to be super formal about all this as well. So I'm going to assume we have some, some atomic propositions which um, these will be denoted with lowercase Greek letters. Um, then I'll have uppercase Roman letters. These will be formulas. So these are built uh, from the atomic propositions inductively. 
um, using the connectives. So we use this and, this or, this implies, and the negation symbol. Um, okay, and then also I'll need like context. So gamma, so uppercase Greek letters, gamma, delta, pi. These will be um, lists of formulas. So in another formulation, you could also, you could think of these as multisets because we'll have a thing where we can permute elements arbitrarily. So you could think of these as multisets as well. And uh, well, these can be empty. So this could be possibly empty. Uh, okay, and then finally I'll need a weird piece of notation, which I'll do delta C. And this is, it's either a formula C um, or it's like the empty list. It's just, you'll see why I need this. It's, it's sort of weird, but okay. All right, so now the idea about uh, behind the sequent calculus is that, um, so we have these sequents. So a sequent is like a formal expression type thing. So we have like a1 up to an being formulas on the left hand of the sequent. Then we have a turnstile symbol. And then we have uh, some other formulas on the right hand side. So this thing is called a sequent. Um, and basically our proof theory will derive se uh, sequence like new sequence from old ones and that will constitute a proof. And now the way you interpret this is these things here on the left, these are going to be the premises. And these things here on the right are going to be the conclusions. Um, but we have these weird commas happening in between. So there's like multiple formulas there. And so we need to somehow say what, the, what these commas mean. And for now, at least in the classical logic and intuitionistic logic case, um, here you have to interpret the commas differently on the left and the right. And so here it's going to be sort of like a disjunction, uh, sorry, like a conjunction. So you have to imagine these, these commas here being like ands. And on the right hand side, you have to imagine these as being like ors. So if I had like a1 up to an, turn style symbol b1 up to bn, this is saying that if I assume a1 and and so on up to an, then I can deduce one of these things. So like b1 or b2 or so on. And actually you can prove then once we have the full sequence calculus that if you can prove a thing with the commas, this is the same as is equivalent to proving a thing with the ands and it's the same over there with the ors. Okay, so um, basically, yes. For the intuitionistic case, and this is sort of interesting, um, is that in the intuitionistic case, we get intuitionistic logic basically by taking the same sequent rules as for classical logic, but restricting to having only at most one formula on the right. And this is like not really clear why this should be the case, at least for me, but it's somehow, if you, if you adapt the rules in such a way that you obey this restriction, it means that you somehow enforce uh, this, these two constraints. We'll see, we'll see why this is happening, but it's not at all apparent why this should be the case, at least uh, for me. Okay, so basically intuitionistic sequence will be something like you have a1 up to an and then like just a b. And correspondingly, you restrict the rules so that you never get like more things on the right. Is this somehow because you would have two, you would have like, if, if it was b1 comma b2, would you then, would it, intuitionistically, would you have two separate sequence, a1 to an uh, entails b1 and a1 to an entails b2? Because I guess the idea of the intuitionistic logic, right, is if you prove B1 or B2, mm -hmm. you have proved at least one of them, mm -hmm. right? Is that the idea or, or is it not? Is it, uh, will we just maybe I think so. The best way to see it after is in the negation law. Mm -hmm. So the law for negation, if you check also in the thing, will be that you can just move one thing from the sequence to the other side and vice versa. And so this means that like if you move this to this side and then move it back, you'll get like a double negated version of it. And what the, the restriction here is saying is that basically you can only move something from here to the right if this is, our, is, if this is empty. Right. And so basically you can't do this double negation move. And so you remove certain symmetries from the sequence calculus which removes this double negation thing. Thanks. That's sort of what's happening. But yeah. All right, 
So, uh, so now I need to decide how much of, this, of these rules I want to write down because it's sort of tedious, but maybe I can do, so that's why I have uh, given you the handout which have uh, the rules there. Um, So yeah, I think I'll just sort of do some examples here because otherwise this will take too long and it's probably not so interesting to watch me write sequence on the blackboard. But um, so basically there's the, the sequence, uh, so I'm going to start sort of with uh, classical and intuitionistic logic and I'll kind of do it at the same time because the rules are very similar. So in both cases, we have this initial rule, which is maybe the most important rule, um, which tells you that from no, like without any premises, you can derive the sequent um, A entails A for any formula A. So this is like identities and this is important to get started because this gives you your starting point for all your proofs. Okay, and then there's a second thing which uh, is sort of uh, modeling modus ponens, which is the cut rule, which is saying that if you have uh, a proof, well, so I think, wait a minute, I, I'll do it like this. So we have, I'll do the intuitionistic one here. So if we have A and then there's delta and then we have possibly some conclusion C. So basically it's saying if, if uh, this list of formulas gamma entails A and A together with a list of formulas delta entails some formula C, possibly the empty formula, uh, then we can cut A, so we can compose these two things, and the contexts sort of merge. So that's what's happening there. So this is like uh, sort of like a composition, if you think about these things as arrows in a category, but actually um, these arrows here, I mean, the, like to model this in terms of categories, you would be thinking about poly categories, and this is like the composition law in poly categories which is weird because you're not just plugging every, all the outputs into all the inputs, but you're only allowed to plug one output into one input. Mm -hmm. what, like, in terms of what if you want to, like, this list of formulas are possibly empty? Okay, so what I mean here is that gamma is something like, uh, maybe I shouldn't use A, something like B1 comma up to Bn, but it could also be empty. So either, either something like this or it's like the empty list. So it's just saying that we can have arbitrary formulas sitting over here separated by commas. We don't care what they are in any context. I mean, the, 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 these are called contexts. So basically, in, if you have A in any, surrounded by any context, you can use this rule. Okay, so this is the intuitionistic case because I've restricted here to having only one formula on the right. But more generally, um, I could put in the classical case, I could have some context also here and also some context lambda happening over here. And in that case, I'd have to again merge the context like this. So the red stuff is what's happening in the classical case and the white stuff, yeah, it's, sorry. It's just, so here it's the, these are two separate sequence happening there. Does this make sense? I mean, you can also look at the, on the, on the, on the rules in the separate, like in the two separate cases. The only difference that's happening here is that in the classical case, we're allowing for additional formulas happening on the right of this sequent and also on this sequent. And the way we're combining it is we're basically like superimposing these two things and just removing the A's. Okay, so these are the two maybe most important structural rules, or maybe they're not structural. The initial one isn't really a structural one. Maybe the, I don't know. So then there's another series of structural rules um, so the first one is saying that basically you can just permute, um, you can arbitrarily permute uh, formulas in your sequent. So if you have something like gamma A, B, and then let's say delta, and then over here you have something else happening. 
So then you're allowed to permute these two formulas A and B. Okay, so basically, because these things can be anything or empty, it means that you can arbitrarily permute your formulas, formulas on the left. So this would be like left exchange rule. And this is the only rule that you have in the intuitionistic case, because in the intuitionistic case, you have at most one formula on the right, so it doesn't make sense to permute it. Um, in the classical case, you have a second exchange rule for, which is completely symmetric to this one, just with uh, the permutation happening on the right. And if you think about these things as multisets, to start with, it doesn't matter because in the multisets, you're not keeping track of order. Okay, so that's uh, the, uh, the exchange rule. Then there's a contraction. So this is something that allows you to get rid of premises. Um, so we have, if you have two copies of the premise A and you can prove something from, from those, then one copy of the premises A is sufficient. So this is called uh, left contraction. And well, in classical logic and intuitionistic logic, this makes sense. Like if you just, if you think about these things as sort of being uh, your hypotheses, then duplicating a hypothesis isn't gonna give you anything more if you want to uh, construct a proof. So it's enough just to have one copy of the hypothesis. Okay, and then again, in the classical case, I mean, here I sort of, I messed up. This would be the classical case that you have actually multiple things over here. In the intuition, intuitionistic case, you would only have at most one formula. And here in the classical case, you can have more stuff over here happening as well. Okay, so that's the contraction rule on the left. And then there's also a weakening rule, which I'll again only give the left one. So this is saying that if you can prove, do it like that. If you can prove some conclusion from your premises, then you can add additional hypotheses, like an additional hypothesis A, and still be able to prove the same conclusions. So, and in the classical case, again, you have possibly more stuff over there. So this is the left weakening rule. Weakening because, well, you have a weaker set of assumptions. Like you're assuming more to prove the same thing. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, these are the left rules. There's corresponding right rules. So they're exactly, in classical logic, it's com completely symmetric. So you can also contract two formulas on the left and you can also add arbitrary formulas on the right. And there just the meaning is different because we're interpreting things disjunction-like. So saying that, you know, if, if this is an or, then I can add whatever I want on the right-hand side and it's still true, uh, yeah, okay. So this is the, the structural rules, and now we come to the connectives. Uh, yeah. So the lists are assumed to be finite, right? Yes. But is, is, is there a meaningful version where? Where I'm they're not, infinite. Yes. Mm. <laughs> you know, okay. That's a good question. So this all of these rules. This rules you to work, right? Yeah, so all of these rules basically introduce, we'll see when we introduce connectives, they all take like two sequence or one sequence and then introduce like one connective. Mm -hmm. So basically you'll never, with these rules, you'll only ever get finite mm -hmm. like complexity of the, of the formulas that result. But like if you want to introduce quantifiers, what you do is you like you quantify over like all sequence or something like that, or like larger infinite collections and that, that works fine. But I don't think it's necessary. I mean, even then, you don't need infinite lists of premises and conclusions. You just need like an infinite need to be able to prove an infinite number of sequence uh, sequence to like derive the quantified sequence. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's any if there would be any reason to have these infinite versions. I mean, the the yeah. Semantics is very interesting. Okay, so we'll see. I mean, the semantics for classical logic are Boolean algebras, and the semantics for intuitionistic logic will be Heiting algebras, yeah. And if you go to categories, then the Heiting algebras become Cartesian closed categories or bi Cartesian closed categories, and Boolean algebras don't have a categorical analog. We'll see that this, the next part in the talk. But if you want to model these things with, uh, so in the case, if you wanted to do like, like categories with, uh, with these commas, then you have to do basically for classical logic, you'd have to do poly categories. But and only not multi, right? 
No, and for intuitionistic, it would be multi. Yeah, because you have all the you have the objects on the left, and you only have one on the right. And by poly, you mean bo like multi both? Both, yes, or? on both sides. So this is basically, I mean, multi categories are basically colored operads. So yeah, yeah exactly. But yeah. I didn't know that there was such a thing called a poly category. Poly categories are like, I don't know what the like dependent operators. <laughs> I mean, you have like a, so the the morphisms look like this. So this is what like composition in a poly category looks like. Okay, okay, okay. It looks like a plot. It does look like a plot. Okay. And the reason, so the composition law has restrictions on what you can, like you always can only plug one of them into the other, like just one and then the rest gets sort of bypassed. Right. And it means that you kind of don't get any loops. That's sort of what the restriction is doing. Okay, so for the connectives, um, I'll maybe just do again like uh, some representative ones. Yeah, so the other thing you can do is you can collapse this. You can rep represent poly categories as a category. Then you have two monoidal products. And uh, then you model everything on the left of your sequence with one of the monoidal products and everything on the right with the other. Those are called linearly distributive categories or something like that. And then, yeah. Okay. So, so exactly, connective. So, uh, well, the, the rule for introducing uh, this junction on the left is as follows. So in order to prove that A or B prove something, you need to prove that both A proves this and B prove the same thing. So like in order to be able to yeah, say that I can drive delta C from A or B, I need to be able to do it for both. Okay. Um, so here, gamma can be the empty list. Uh, yes, it can be the empty list. And again, sorry, I for, like I'm, I'm sort of in the classical case, we could have arbitrary stuff happening over there. And yeah, the most interesting case is basically when gamma is the empty list if we're thinking about models and that sort of thing. So and if you want to think about uh, uh, models for these things, then you probably always want to take everything to be empty and see what it is. Okay, um, so on the right, maybe I'll do the, so on the right, there's two rules for introducing the disjunction. So we have basically if gamma proves, say, A, um, then gamma will also prove A or B for any B. So this is in the intuitionistic case, and in the classical case, we can again have some arbitrary context happening here. And well, there's one rule for each for each uh, inclusion or map or whatever you want to call it. Like the same thing holds with B. Okay. And the uh, rules for the conjunction are symmetric. So in the conjunction case, basically you have the left rule being the one where you only need one sequent. So I'll stop uh, in a moment with this, I think. Um, uh, whoops. I mean, this is sort of the same as the weakening rule, if you think about it. So the way to introduce an and on the left is you just have your sequence, and then also A and B will prove that because you have more premises. Okay, so, so I think I'll stop with writing down these rules for the moment, but I hope you get the idea of how, how sort of this sequence style calculus works. And now we'll basically say that um, well, a sequence is provable if we can, you know, so a sequence would be provable if we can construct it using these inference rules and uh, base with, with no premises. 
So I'll just give an example here of a, of a, a derivation of a sequence. So maybe I should have started a bit higher. So the way to use, anyways, these sequent rules, that's is the sort of the how-to user guide is always start from the bottom. So never start from thinking about how to, like, what the first things you need, but actually just start from the bottom and then see what rules would apply and which ones uh, bring you in the right direction. So, okay, let's try to prove this formula here. Alpha implies that beta implies alpha. Well, so the first thing, so I haven't given you the implication rules, I guess. Um, maybe this is, so implication works. In order to prove an implication on the right, you need to prove that the thing you have on the left side of the implication entails the thing on the right. So this is like, a, yeah, I mean, it's the right, right adjoint and. Okay, so this would be the, the left rule for implication. And well, now we can just do that again. We do the left rule for implication again, and we get, um, yeah, I guess the way the rule is stated, you don't get and, but you get this comma. Okay, and now we have that we need to show that a alpha comma beta entails alpha. And well, if we had alpha entails alpha, we would be done by the initial rule. So basically now we use the, the weakening rule in reverse. So this would be left weakening to get rid of beta, and then we're done. Okay, and so in, in this actually we've only used rules uh, that have at most one formula on the right-hand side, so this proof is valid in both classical and intuitionistic logic. Okay, and so a good sort of, sort of from these rules, it's kind of apparent, but I'll just record it as a fact because it'll be kind of useful that if you can prove A entails B, um, this happens precisely when you can prove from no premises this a, this implication, A implies B. So this is uh, called the deduction theorem in logic, and uh, yeah, it holds. I think the rule is actually written as the right implication rule. Oh, sorry, yes, of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> I was just uh, very much focused on the left uh, stuff over there. Yes, this, yeah, obviously, I mean, so if you haven't, I guess, maybe I should say, because I didn't cover all the rules. So the, the rules always come in pairs. You have a left rule and a right rule, and it always tells you how to introduce the connective on the left and the right. And it's sort of different from this type theory thing where we had introduction and elimination rules, right? There we always had a rule to introduce the connective and one to get rid of it. Here it's kind of analogous, but it's just converted into a left rule and the right rule because you can think of the sequence sort of as saying, uh, this is like mapping out property and this is like mapping in property on the right. So it's kind of, it's, it's sort of like the uh, introduction elimination thing, but like rotated by 90 degrees. Okay. So now I'll move on to some semantics because we've already started talking about it. So, I mean, recall like if the first time you see classical logic, probably people will write down something like this, like a truth table for, for these various connectives and state that this is the definition for the connectives. For example, and um, has this truth table and or has this truth table. Yeah, and the implication is defined like this. Uh, so yeah, I guess I need to decide what's on the, like the first argument. Let's say this is the first argument, so then this would be true, true. Uh, this is the only one that's false and like this. Okay. so. This is sort of the standard uh, Boolean semantics that you, that's probably the first thing you learn when you learn about logic. And well, yeah, so we'll see in a moment what this actually has to do with this entire sequence calculus. But uh, for now, we can think about uh, how we interpret a formula using these, uh, these truth tables. So suppose we have some formula phi, which depends on some, uh, some atomic, uh, propositions, well then if we're given, given some function, which I'll call V, which maps these atomic propositions um, into, in this case, the set 0, 1. So we assign each one of these atomic propositions occurring in phi a truth value. Well, then we can extend this, uh, um, well, whatever values this has along this formula inductively. So. Uh, so this allows us to, you know, we'll do it like this. 
we can extend um, v well along the formula phi inductively. And I'll just do an example in a moment. I kind of don't want to spend too much time saying what this, like writing down exactly what that would mean. So let's maybe do um, do this example here. So if I have, let's say I want to come up with a value for this formula here that I had before. So how would I do this? Well, I decompose this formula along the connectives. So here I have an alpha and then a beta implies alpha. Okay. And now I assign each of these atomic propositions a truth value. And so one way of doing this is I could assign both zero, I could do this, I could do this, or I could do this. And then we read off the, the well, the definition of these connectives in terms of the truth values, we read off what the values have to be. So here beta is false, so this is true. Here beta is true and alpha is uh, false, so this is false, and then here this is true. And then we uh, have to do the thing again with alpha and the implication with these values. So, well, everything's true, which it's supposed to be because there's this, well, fact. Well, Namely that uh, this model here with the uh, truth values is actually complete for classical logic. What does that mean? Well, it means that if regardless what values you assign to the atomic propositions, if you get back a one, if that's the case, then your formula automatically holds in classical logic and vice versa. If your formula is provable, in classical logic using, for example, the sequent calculus, then regardless what values you assign to your atomic formulas, you'll get a one if you inductively extend these values. So, yeah, I don't know how I phrase this in the notes. Yeah, so I'll just do this again as a fact. So we have that this sequent here is provable. Um, in classical logic, um, if and only if, well, uh, phi, maybe I'll call it, uh, so we, we extend v along phi inductively to get some value v of phi. Uh, so if the value of v of phi is equal to one for all, well, all the signs of v, But uh, this is sort of a special case for classical logic and doesn't really work for any other logics, or maybe not any other, but at least not for intuitionistic logic. And so this is like a, a sort of magical case that you have this very small object which completely determines truth and provability in your logic. And so the way we're going to, we're going to try to generalize these semantics to intuitionistic logic. And the way to do this is to observe that, well, these, these values zero and one can be put in like a, we can define a, a partial order, which I'll call B with zero being less than or equal to one. And so we're thinking of zero is false and one is true. And then these rules up there are actually giving us binary operations on this, um, on this uh, partial order. And in fact, one can show that, well, the, um, the and operation this is actually uh, meets, so this is like a greatest lower bounds. Uh, this is a join, that's the least upper bound. And this thing is uh, what I'll be calling a residuation, but it just means that it's uh, right adjoint to this uh, meet operation. Okay, so in fact, um, it'll turn out that this B, this is a, is a bounded lattice um, with a residuation um, and also satisfying uh, the law of double negation 
which I haven't really uh, written down there. But um, so this basically leads us to defining two objects, namely uh, Heiting and Boolean algebras. So Heiting algebra. Um, is a bounded lattice um, I'll call it I guess a so it has meets joins uh, it has a bottom element and a top element that's what it means to be bounded um, and also I guess I'll write with a residuation So this is this implication. So this is defined, uh, defined by or characterized by the fact that the meet of A and B is less than C if and only if A is less than B implies C. Okay, so that's what it means to be a Heiting algebra. And um, we call, so a Heiting algebra is a Boolean algebra. So I guess A uh, Heiting is a Boolean algebra if, in addition, we have that not not a is equal to a where this negation is defined as a implies the bottom element so heiting algebra is basically a structure an ordered structure where we have all the connectives that we have in intuitionistic logic and if in addition this heiting algebra happens to satisfy the law of double negation we call it the boolean algebra okay um, so, yeah, I think at this point maybe we can make five minutes break um, because we're already uh, 50 minutes in and I'll resume after. We started with thinking about um, what it means to have, like, for logical statements to hold. We kind of assumed that proofs are relevant for this. Um, we introduced a sequent calculus for classical and in intuitionistic logic and now we've moved to semantics which is basically a way of, well, seeing if things, well, ideally, you have a complete semantics where you can just check in your model whether something is true, and then you can deduce from that that it's provable. Okay? If, if your model is complete, no. Oh, your model is complete. Yeah. Okay. But yes, it's true that, like yes, there's going to be a thing where it's like, a thing is provable if it's true in all, like for example, a formula is valid in Boolean logic if it's true in all Boolean algebras. But it's also the case that a formula is provable if it's true in this Boolean algebra. This yes, this particular one. Yeah. But this is a special case and, yeah. Okay, so, so, okay. so I'm going to kind of uh, sketch what a model is for a logic. So assume our logic has some connectives, um, which I'll call like square C I. And we're going to have uh, M be some partially ordered set with corresponding connectives. Uh, so what I mean by this is that if your logic uh, connectives. If your logic has, and I'll do these like corner, cornery M. So if your logic has like binary connected, like if your logic has a binary connective C1, then M has a binary operation on it, M1. And if your logic has some weird ternary operation, then you would need a like ternary, I don't know. This is overly general, but I'm just saying like, in the case here, it was clear if, we're, if we want to model for a Heiting algebra, uh, sorry, model for intuitionistic logic, we need to have a, a partially ordered set A, which has correspond, like connectives corresponding to all the constants and operations in our logic. Um, this is just what I mean. And so 
Um, we say that M is a model. Um, a model for our logic. Um, well, I mean, there's many ways to do this, but I'm going to do it like this. If uh, whenever um, the sequent A to B is provable, um, is provable in L, then we have that V of A is less than or equal to V of B. Um, so for all, for all valuations, where we're assigning the, uh, yeah, this is kind of, again. So it's, it's the same idea as above here. So we have a formula, in this case it's A, and we have a formula B. Um, and we're assigning each of the atomic propositions that occur in these formula, we're assigning them an element of our structure. So basically here, V will be some function which goes from all the atomic propositions um, to M. And we want this inequality to hold in M for all such valuations. And basically, we're, the, we're again extending the valuation uh, along the formula. You know, is this, is this sen make sense from the analogy up here? Like, what we're doing is we're, so maybe as an example, let's say we had a formula that's like alpha 1 and alpha 2 um, entails beta. Then what we're doing is we're first assigning values in M to each of these. So we would say map alpha 1 to some A, we would map alpha 2 to some B, and we would map uh, beta to some C. And these are all elements of M for our model. And now we extend um, this, this valuation along the connectives we have here. So this thing here would be evaluated as the meet of A and B in M. And this thing stays C, and we're saying M is a model if whenever we can prove such a thing, we have that the corresponding inequality holds in M. So the, the use of this is basically that if you know that you're, like say you're interested in some structure and you know that it's a model for, I don't know, intuitionistic logic, then instead of like going and proving things about your structure, you can actually just prove a corresponding statement in intuitionistic logic and then know that there'll be a corresponding inequality in your poset. Okay, so and now the uh, second thing is, um, we'll say um, M is complete. Uh, complete if the converse holds. Um, well, the converse being that whenever you have such an inequality in uh, M for all of these valuations, then also the thing is provable. Uh -huh, so, okay. So, this is, it's a model if this thing holds, and the converse is, so this is an implication, this provable, then this, the converse would be, this implies this, but yes, I agree. It's not clear which which. <laughs> uh. okay. And so, as an example, we or uh, well, we know or I don't know. Probably we've never seen a proof of this, but uh, the the this two-element Boolean algebra is a complete model for classical logic. So that would be an example. And the way you prove this is, well, on the one hand, you have to show that whenever you can prove something in classical logic, it holds uh, in the Boolean algebra. And the way you do this is by showing that all of the inference rules apply in your Boolean algebra. And then the other way around is, uh, yeah, is a bit more complicated and requires more proof theory. So, but anyways, I'll just, uh, mentioned that that's a complete model there. And now the idea is that basically we want to construct an analogous complete model for intuitionistic logic. And so um, this thing is called the, the Lindenbaum algebra.
Okay? And basically, if you, if you just naively want to think about having a complete model, well, basically what a complete model is saying is that the inequality in your model is somehow equivalent to having a proof from A to B. So sort of the logical thing to do is just to take literally proofs as your arrows in your poset, like as the relation. So the Lindenbaum algebra has an underlying set X, which consists, I mean, so you can do this construction for any logic, but I'll just do it for intuitionistic logic. So these, this consists of IL formulas. And well, then we can define, on this we can define, uh, well, okay, so first I need to maybe say what the order is. So A is less than or equal to B, if and only if A is provable from B in intuitionistic logic. Um, okay, and so now we have like operations on here. For example, we have a meet operation given literally by taking the meet. I mean, this is sort of bad notation, but it's like you literally you do the thing with the formulas, and yeah, you get the corresponding operations. I mean, I could like. We differentiate, this is like in the Lindenbaum algebra. Yeah, but you, you get what I'm saying, I hope. Okay, so this is almost good enough. The only thing that is not yet quite right is that this thing is not yet a partially ordered set because we have equivalent elements. So, uh, so basically, what we need to do is we need to quotient out. So the, the Lindenbaum algebra will be defined as this X quotiented out by an equivalence relation where um, A is equivalent to B. Well, if and only if, well, A is, uh, we can prove B from A and also we can prove A from B. And well, there's some checking to do that all of these operations we've defined um, actually work with this equivalence relation, but uh, if you do that, everything checks out. And this thing, so it turns out that um, LA is actually a Heiting algebra. And moreover, um, it is a complete model A model for intuition extended logic. So the Heiting algebra thing is just something you have to check from, from these operations. Just check the, the things in the definition. Um, the fact that it's a complete model, well, so the fact that it's a model follows from the fact that every Heiting algebra is actually a model for intuitionistic logic. This is, uh, comes from the fact that all of the um, inference rules hold in any Heiting algebra. Um, the completeness is actually much easier here because basically we've said that A is less than or equal to B if and only if there's a proof of the sequence A entails B. And so if this does not hold, then also we won't have this relation. So that immediately gives you the completeness. And because we've now found a complete model for intuition, uh, intuition, uh, intuitionistic logic, we can sort of state the proposition which is uh, sort of what Udil was talking about before. So the sequence A uh, in, uh, entails B is provable in intuitionistic logic. So there's an equivalence here if, well, it's the corresponding valuations um, well, if this holds um, in every Heiting algebra um, for all, uh, I don't know, valuations V, okay? So basically we have this statement that we have a uh, provability in intuitionistic logic corresponds to some uh, inequality holding in every Heiting algebra. And well, the one direction follows from the fact that every Heiting algebra is a model, 
And the other direction follows from the fact that we found a complete model. So um, there exists some Heiting algebra. Like if this is not provable, then we found the Heiting algebra where this does not hold. And that gives us the other implication. And now the case for Boolean algebra so is more special because there we actually have an additional equivalence saying that if this inequality holds actually in any or some, maybe I should write some, some Boolean algebra um, with the proviso that um, the top and the bottom elements are not allowed to be the same. And this is sort of a very special thing, right? So it's also true that this is provable in classical logic if it holds in all Boolean algebras, but it turns out that it's enough to actually hold just in one because you can embed this 0, 1 Boolean algebra into any other Boolean algebra, and that gives you the, this other direction here. So that's a very, somehow very special. Okay, so now to sort of wrap up this theoretical part of the talk, I'm just going to kind of sketch uh, where, where one can take these semantics further. So basically one could complain that, well, okay, we've, we've, we have this model, which is just like an ordered structure, but having this uh, relation in the order holding between two elements only tells us that there exists some proof, but it doesn't really tell us how many proofs and it doesn't distinguish between different proofs. So the next level is basically to extend this idea of a Lindenbaum algebra to get a category where um, the objects are again uh, formulas, but now the morphisms in the category correspond to distinct proofs. Okay, so basically in the case of intuitionistic logic, one can do this, and what one gets is a Cartesian closed category because one has products given by this uh, uh, meet operation, and one also has, um, well, closure by, by this implication happening. And so, in fact, and so this is the, what's uh, called the Curry-Howard correspondence, the Cartesian closed category that one gets as sort of the Lindenbaum algebra equivalent for intuitionistic logic is sort of the same thing or corresponds in some way to the simply typed lam uh, lambda calculus. So, um, to, to kind of nail down what the correspondence there is exactly, one has to really like define what one means by simply typed lambda calculus. The standard simply typed lambda calculus only has um, like products and function types, so we don't actually have this disjunction there. I mean, you can extend the simply typed lambda calculus to get sort of a disjunction, but it's not super useful. So basically to get an isomorphism from this Lindenbaum category or whatever you would want to call it, you would have to extend your simply typed lambda calculus to also have the disjunction. But if you just sort of build a Lindenbaum type category um, using um, the, uh, the, the, the conjunction and your uh, implication, then actually this thing is isomorphic to like types with uh, lambda functions between them. And this tells us that actually this path of going, you know, thinking about intuitionistic logic as a constructive logic, this, this really makes sense because if you go down this path, what you end up with is basically a model for computation, which is Turing complete. Now, the same thing doesn't work for classical logic. And the reason is that there's this, this, this obstacle to it, <laughs> namely that um, any Cartesian closed category um, where you have that uh, A implies the, I'm, like this is isomorphic to A. So whenever you have double negation in your Cartesian closed category, um, then this is actually just a preorder. So somehow imposing this constraint equality here is too much and everything collapses and you only get at most one arrow between every two objects. So if you want to interpret this category as a theory of computation, it's a pretty boring theory where you have at most one function between any two types. So not, yeah, that's not really what one wants. Okay, so the, the question is then, so in the, in, yeah? In classical logic, all the proofs are equivalent? Yes. Also, if, if you take these, into, these sequent proofs, 
there's, okay, so there's, uh, there's some details there, which is that you identify certain proofs with each other. You have these conversion rules between proofs. In like in natural deduction, one of the rules is that if you first you know introduce a connective and then immediately eliminate it, that's the same as just not introducing it. They're sort of in the same thing for the sequent calculus. Um, and it turns out because of this fact that all proofs in classical logic in the sequent calculus are actually equivalent to one another under these rules. So uh, every proposition has at most one proof, which okay, using equivalence coming. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's these conversion rules, like it's, yeah. I mean, I never really got super into understanding why one would choose those conversion rules. It, they seem like mostly they're kind of there for like, like to, to get some nice symmetries and stuff like that in the proof theory, like, but, but they, totally, they're totally, they totally make sense. It's not like it's something really weird. It's, yeah. So which means that like I, I take any two proofs in test proofs of the same fact, in principle, I should be able to turn one into the other just by doing this basic operation. Yeah. If you have them proved in the sequent calculus, yeah. Okay, I have to translate them. Okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know how this would expand to like actual like math, like where you. Yeah. But I think well, well, in, in, in so there you start with certain assumptions as well, and so these will differ, right? Depending on your proof, I don't know. We start with the same assumptions. Yeah. Say, say the same theorem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get. Yes, yeah. Groups, right? But in principle, you could just convert them. Yeah. Some yeah, yeah, I'm not sure exactly how the, the, yeah. these, these proofs you would have in a textbook yeah. correspond to proofs yeah, in yeah. the sequent calculus. Yeah. That's yeah. sort of where we're, yeah. And are, are there easy examples of non equivalent proofs in intuitionistic logic? Mm. Do you concrete examples? <laughs> um, yeah, probably, but I, I don't yeah. have anything yeah. on, on the top of my head. I mean, you, yeah, so for this, you'd have to know exactly what the conversion rules is and, are, and then probably you'd find an easy example. Okay, so yes, I'm basically almost basically done with this. So, so I was saying that uh, somehow intuitionistic logic corresponds to some theory of computation while classical logic doesn't. And the way that intuitionistic logic sort of retains its computational characters because we've restricted these sequence to only have one, uh, one conclusion on the right. So somehow this restriction was enough to not cause everything to collapse. And well, you can ask, what, what if I want this sort of classical negation, um, but I don't necessarily want, well, but I still want my, my proof theory to not collapse in this way. And the, this is sort of one motivation why one would want to look at linear logic, which is a logic which has this classical negation, but um, has like, uh, computational interpretations. And well, the trade-off for getting, getting this is that one has to get rid of the contraction and weakening rules. So recall that we had uh, something like this. Uh, so this is the contraction rule and the, uh, for the left. And then we also have left weakening and same on the right, it'll just do the left rules. So in linear logic, one just gets rid of these and the corresponding right rules. And this then man, uh, enables you to still retain a uh, computational character to your proof theory, but without, um, well, yeah, but still retaining this classical negation. So I think I don't really have time so much to introduce this now uh, anymore, but I guess what I want to say about uh, the linear logic is if you look at the, the rules, the sequent rules I've written down, they're pretty much the same as for classical logic, but with one big difference, namely that we actually split the conjunctive and disjunctive connectives into two. So maybe I'll just mention this briefly. So the and actually splits into two connectives namely in the one connective which is denoted with a tensor symbol and the other connective is, I guess, uh, is just an ampersand. So this is called tensor and this is called width. And the disjunctive, uh, disjunction also splits into, uh, maybe I should do this, into a, a par which is uh, denoted with an invert, inverted ampersand and uh, this uh, O plus symbol. 
And the reason for this splitting is that if you look at the sequent rules, um, for one of these, you have the same context on the left and the right, and for the other, you don't. So here you have, you can, yeah, I think I don't really have time to go into this so much, but um, basically one of these is like context sensitive and the other isn't. And in the case for classical logic, this doesn't matter because you have weakening and contraction rules, which means that you can always adapt your context to be the same in both cases. So sort of if you define the rules uh, in the sequent calculus for linear logic, but also had this weakening and contraction, then actually both uh, these guys would be equivalent and these guys would be equivalent. But because we don't have weakening and contraction, uh, these remain distinct. Yeah. And so there's uh, really nice interpretations for all of this classical logic stuff. Um, basically, um, because one doesn't have weakening and contraction, one can interpret this as sort of a resource sensitive logic, which means that you actually keep track of how many times you use your premises and you're only allowed to use each premise once. So, I mean, there's this idea from logic called relevance logic where Basically, you're, you enforce the constraint that you're only allowed to include things as your premises that you're actually using in your proof. So that's interesting. That's like forbidding weakening because you're saying that if I can prove delta from gamma, then if you have weakening, then I can assume some other you know, hypothesis and still prove delta, but somehow this one is then irrelevant. So relevance logic gets rid of just the weakening, but linear logic also gets rid of contraction, which is saying that well, having two copies of your, your premises is not the same as just having one. It means that you can't arbitrarily get rid of resources. And so linear logic has this really nice interpretation in terms of these resources, yeah. which I sadly can't really talk about at the moment anymore. And instead, I think, well, so are there any questions to this part? Yeah. Yeah, so linear logic, the models for linear logic are called um, Girard quantals. So quantals are like, um, yeah, so they're uh, lattices which have a fulfill a specific distributive law. And also the Girard version of these quantals has like a negation and, the, and uh, this negation has to fulfill, satisfy the law of double negation. So you can, I mean, if you Google, uh, you know, linear logics, uh, semantics, you, you'll find the, these Girard quantals. So those are like the, the corresponding thing for the models here. They're like partially ordered um, objects where you have, yeah, you have uh, meets and joins, but then also you have this distributive law. Uh, and you have like a tensor operation. And then the, um, the categorical models for them are called star autonomous categories, which are these linear distributive categories I was talking about before, where you have two different tensor operations that satisfy a certain linear distribution law. And then you also, in order for them to be star autonomous, you need a, like a duality involution, which again, if you do it twice, you get back to where you started. Um, and then if you also have products and coproducts in that category, then you get all the four connectives. Um, you can also think of these star autonomous categories as like representing some sort of free poly category or something, but, or just like a poly category. All right. Um, yes, so let's, let's move on to lean maybe. Okay, so in the next section, I just want to present uh, inductive types. So, okay, so how does this tie in with what I was talking about before? So we kind of saw that if you have a logic, you can sort of generate this uh, free structure. I mean, I guess I didn't show you that this uh, Lindenbaum algebra is like a free model for your logic, but it has a universal property, which says that if you have any model, then you map from the Lindenbaum algebra into, your, uh, into that model. So basically, you're kind of like, to, to get a complete model, you're kind of like generating a free structure. And the corresponding thing works in lean by, by defining inductive types. So inductive types you can think of as defining certain free structures on certain generating functions. So the, the most simple um, type of inductive type is the following. So this will also illustrate what the syntax is. Um, oops. is called, I think, enumerated type or something like that. So basically, in this case, your constructors are just elements. So what this is saying here, inductive is the keyword for defining a new inductive type. New bool is the name for the type. This is giving, saying what type it is. So this new inductive type is of type type one. And these uh, guards here then start the definition of the various constructors. So here I'm saying I have a constructor TT, 
which is just an element of nubool, or just has type nubool. And also I have a constructor ff, which has type nubool. And so you can think of nubool here as being like the disjoint union of tt and ff. And so the way to, to check this in lean is just, so the one, one word of caution is that all of these constructors are always uh, qualified by the name of your type. So that's something that quickly leads to weird errors. But here it says like nubool.tt is a element of nubool or yeah, has type nubool. And the same thing with nubool.pulse. And okay, so basically the functions you get, so going back to this introduction elimination rule duality thing, um, these constructors here are like the introduction rules for your type. And the elimination rules um, are automatically generated by lean. So lean always, when you define an inductive type, it'll define a recursor for that type, which allows you to map out of that type. Now in our case, we have basically two cases. We have the case where there's, you know, the element is TT or the element is FF. And so in order to define a function out of our, our new type, uh, we, so for example, I want to define a function from uh, new bool to string. So basically, I mean, you could use the recursor directly. So there's a, I think it's called uh, rec on or something like that. Maybe I'll just quickly check this. Uh, so new bool dot rec, see you, you have this new bool dot rec on, and this is the recursor function. It has this, this uh, signature here, which is a bit complicated. So instead of using these recursors direct, also it's kind of bad because you have to, you have to write all the arguments like, so anyways, you have to write all the arguments separately. So if you have like uh, say seven different uh, cases up here, you have seven different arguments for your recursor which is bad if you just write it out in one line. And, and also you don't know which one's which, so you have to respect the order you define them in. So th this is not the way to do it in my opinion. Maybe there are some cases where you have to do it like this because the, uh, this way I'm about to present doesn't work, but okay. Anyways, uh, lean supports nice uh, like uh, pattern matching syntax. So the way to do this is uh, as follows. You again use these guards, and then you say what each of the constructors, uh, well, each of the, yeah, what, what a type of that constructor is mapped to. So here I'm saying that nubool.tt will be mapped to the string yes, and um, nubool.ff will be mapped to the string false. Okay, so far no complaints. And then I can uh, eval um, yes, no, uh, nubool.tt, and I get yes. Okay, and if I uh, eval this, I get false. So this is sort of the most basic way of using these inductive types. You can just use them as sort of like lists where you get, uh, where you define the different elements like this, and then to define a function out of your type, what you need to do is you need to say where each of these uh, elements is mapped. But of course, this is not really what you would want to use inductive types for. So the reason why they're called inductive is because you can do more complicated things. For example, um, so here I'm going to define a new way of, well, I'm going to define an, another basically thing that's the same as a product. So I'm going to call it my pair. And here this is saying, this is different from what's happening up here. This is saying my pair depends on alpha and beta. So it, you need to specify, you need to give my pair a type alpha for the first element of the pair and also a type beta in order to generate an element of it. Okay. Uh, type star means it can be any type, in, live in any universe. It's just a no, there's no restriction. Because if I did this, it would, have, it would mean that they have to live in the same universe type one. Okay. And then what, yeah, then what we will do here is we'll make my pair of type, type n where n is the uh, Okay, and so the way to make a pair is I take an element of, of type alpha and an element of type beta, and now this constructor make is giving me an element of type my pair. And basically the way to read this constructor is, yeah, I have these two things, and somehow I, I'm just declaring that there exists some function make which maps these things into my pair, 
And the reason this thing, the, the type is inductive or free is because it's completely like defined by this, well, yeah. So basically for any pair of, of uh, elements in alpha and beta, I get an element of my pair and they'll be distinct, uh, yeah. Okay, and uh, all right, so I wanted to also pre present another thing which I discovered is amazing. I actually haven't seen this in any other programming language, but it's, it's great. So you can define your own notation in Ween, and it's 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 wonderful. Uh, okay. So basically, if you didn't like if you didn't like uh, having you know the for some reason you didn't like the round brackets, you can do your right and left angle notation, and so so the, wrangle, 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 like in like in Lotech. So okay. So the way that you define notation, oh, sorry, I need to also define what this means, of course. So this is just um, my pair, my pair make um, a, b. So these backticks define parts of your notation. So you put everything that's notation between the backticks, and then Ween will kind of figure out what you mean by it in most cases. So you can also do things which seem like they wouldn't work, but they kind of work. I don't know exactly how it works and what the restraints are, but basically, uh, in this case, if we check, so if I sort of uh, copy this notation here, uh, so I can now just use these special characters in order to define pairs. So if I have like uh, variables a, b of some type, maybe I'll do variable a is a, of bool, and variable b is of type the natural numbers. Then you can check what this thing is. This is now in, also displayed internally in lean in the nice notation, and it's my pair of, with uh, bool and natural numbers. Okay, so now to define functions out of these more complicated uh, types, like inductive types, you need to um, again say where each of the sort of constructed elements needs to be mapped. So here I'm going to define a um, exactly. I'm going to define a function from my pair um, alpha beta to my pair beta alpha. So this is just going to swap the, the two arguments. And so what does it do? It takes, and now I can use this nice notation, it takes a pair AB and maps it to BBA. And the, okay, so I need to maybe explain here a bit. So my pair alpha beta, again, for each, so this thing is sort of saying like, I think these are called maybe inductive families or something like this. So this is saying you're defining an inductive type for each choice of types alpha and beta. Um, and so here, this is why when I want to say what the type is, I have to also specify alpha and beta. And my function implicitly depends on the choice of alpha and beta. So this is switcheroo is like a function that's parameterized by types alpha and beta. And it goes from my pair alpha beta to my pair beta alpha because we're swapping around the types. And this is pattern matching. This is saying, I just need to say where one of the constructed element, well, for each constructor, I need to say where a typical element is matched. Yeah. And so this is obviously, I don't know, I, I really like this. So my pair should not exist according to our discussion of square universe. How do you mean? Because uh, you, you, if you star, like it's not bounded. So, it, you know, if you just have to like define it, I think. So in every instance, you would have to say, you know, this is a pi type type star times type star, which doesn't exist already, and then it's going to land in, I mean, if alpha and beta were like type n, type n, you could say my pair is in like type n plus n, yeah. but type n plus n is not bounded, because then mm -hmm. n are free. Yeah. So like the family that would define your pi type doesn't exist, uh, at least according to you. Yeah, but I think, I think what it's just saying, like in each instance, you, you kind of generate a new, For sure. Like, yeah, computer doesn't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. but probably there's no universe in which all of these yeah, exactly. live. Yes. Yeah, this doesn't fit into our discussion. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, which is fine. Yeah, it's but, it's just kidding. But maybe it's you like just, yeah, maybe you yeah, just, just yeah. But, yeah. but maybe just say this is like, 
yeah, you, you, you make a choice in a specific instance and then you get a type, yeah. something like that. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so basically this, this works out like, as you can see here, I reduced this A comma B and it gives me back B comma A. So now we can go do even more complicated things. So I'm going to define a new version of the natural numbers, which is the same as the, the ones that are implemented. So what's going to be different here is that, um, well, so first I have a zero element, which I'll call null. So this is just like a constant. I guess you can also think of these these things here as sort of being like the same function, like the, it defines a function, but from like the one element type. And the function is just called null or something. Okay, and then we also have a, a function next, which goes from my nat to my nat. And this, this defines the natural number. So this is like the successor function. And because uh, inductive types act like free structures, it means that all of these will be uh, distinct. So like basically the only laws I'm imposing are that if you have an element of my nat, then you can get another one called next of that element and yeah, and there's no identification happening. Okay, so. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think there are quotients. I think there's quotients in lean somehow. Yeah, they change. That's actually quite interesting. Okay. But I managed to stop quotients. <laughs> okay. Um, otherwise, maybe define a function out. So you define the natural numbers. You define a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers that does the mod operation. And then you just somehow look at, you just use elements in the image of that somehow. But yeah, it, it, it does, doesn't seem, that seems kind of messy. Uh, if you want to look at it, I'm pretty sure like one of the chapters covers it in the... Yeah, there's definitely a chapter called Quotients somewhere. <laughs> so probably, probably look there, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay, so if you have these more complicated uh, types, well, the, the definition of the functions out of them become more complicated. So here I'm, I mean, okay, here two things are happening. I'm also defining a function with pattern matching which takes two arguments. And so lean has a nice way that you can just sort of list both arguments next to one another and pattern match that way. So here I'm saying if, if I have the null element in the first one and an arbitrary element in the second one and I add them, I should just get the second element. And if I have uh, next, um, I guess n and m, then I want to have this be next um, add n m. And now something is the, you need to make sure to, in the pattern matching, lean is kind of picky about the bracketing, so put everything in brackets, I guess. Um, also here, what's going wrong? Oh, it's my, it needs to be my ad, yes. Okay, <laughs> okay. so this, this is the addition function, so if I reduce, um, what is my example here? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, so let's do next next of null and next of null. So this would be one plus two, and we see it gives three. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and so there's a, also wild cards. So here I'll go back to the standard natural numbers. So here you can put like underscores if you want to just completely ignore uh, what's what's there. So this means that, it, I mean, here I could have sort of used a wildcard because I don't really care what's here, but I'm using the result here. So this is different. I can't use the result over here, I don't think, if I do this with the wildcards. So this is saying regardless, wh whatever it is, I, I uh, just ignore. Okay. And lean will also complain about if you if you define things. So if I did, if I if I said this, I wanted to make this my definition, then there'll be a squiggly yellow thing, and it'll say it's a non-exhaustive. Uh, so I'm missing this case. So that's also nice. So this is basically analogous to what like Haskell does or other functional programming languages do. Yes. What 
Well, it's it, because it's, it's going case by case from top to bottom. Yeah. Yes. So okay. So okay. This is if, I guess if you don't know. <laughs> yeah. So it's saying it's first checking this pattern. If this applies, it'll do that. Then it's checking this pattern. If it applies, it'll do that. And then it does all the remaining cases. So this is a way to catch all other cases. And I could. Yeah, but I could also do this, right? I mean, this would look super contradictory, but uh, okay, it is complaining. Uh, it's redundant. Yeah, okay, thanks. But actually, I wanted to make the point that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lean. Okay. So, anyways, so the reduce. This is there's some zero here. There's not any zero there. Okay. So are there any questions about this? In that case, I'll maybe just scroll through some more complicated code. OK, so basically, inductive types allow you to define like logical formulas and stuff like this very easily, because that's exactly how you define these things in math. So you basically just say, like, I have certain propositions. So here I'm defining an inductive type called linear formulas. So I'm Defining that P is like just a linear formula. So it's like an atomic proposition. Q is and R is. And then I also have certain operations on my formulas, like taking a dual is an operation that takes a formula and produces another formula, just giving its dual. Par takes two formulas and puts them together. So par is that weird uh, inverted ampersand uh, connective, and so on. So I implement all the connectives here, and this builds me inductively all formulas. And then because of this nice notation feature, I can actually introduce notation for all of these. So instead of writing this thing, I can just write p tensor q. So that's super nice. And then to define a function, for example, dualization on formulas, I can say that, well, if, if my formula just has the form p for, for that atomic formula p, then I just formally you know, take its dual, um, which is just like dual p or something like that. And uh, the more interesting cases are here for connectives. I want to implement certain De Morgan dualities. So this par here should be De Morgan dual to the tensor. And so this is exactly how I'm defining it with the pattern matching. So I'm saying that P par Q is just defined as the dual of P tensor, the dual of Q, and so on. Also here I said that if something's already a dual, then just give me back the original thing. So this enforces that the double dual is the same as the original. Then I can introduce some new notation. I can introduce linear implication, which is defined as it is classically just as uh, you know, not P or Q, but the or is replaced by par. Then I define what it means to be a sequent. So I say that there's an empty sequent. There's for each linear formula, I get a sequent. Then also, if I have two sequents, I can bind it with a comma. Um, so I can introduce notation for the sequence, which are now with semicolons. And if I just want to create a sequence from a, uh, from a formula, I introduce this turnstile symbol. Then I, for the sequence, I have to uh, require some axioms. So you can do this with axiom. And here I'm just basically saying there exists some pi type, namely this pi type here, um, which allows you to convert from sequence of this form to sequence of this form. So it's saying the comma operation is associative. Here I have another axiom where I'm saying that the comma operation is a commutative operation. And finally, I'm saying that the, uh, the empty sequent, if I compose it with any sequent, it gives me back the original. And with all that in hand, I can define what it means to be a linear proof. And this is sort of the key part where, it, so in, in standard lean, right, we have this, uh, this identification of proofs and propositions, which happens because Basically, the internal logic that we want to prove stuff in just happens to also be the you know, logic of functions and products and so on. But if that weren't the case, we'd actually have to define an explicit type of proofs and then construct elements of that type. And so this is what I'm doing here, because the problem is, of course, that uh, linear logic is weaker than uh, the logic that's implemented in lean. So in lean, like the law of contraction and weakening, uh, those just hold because you have like a function going from A times B to any other thing if you have a function going from A to the other thing. So basically, I have to define a new class of proofs. And here I'm saying how to construct proofs. So I'm saying that I have um, an initial uh, constructor, which gives me from any formula a proof of the sequent A and its dual, and so on. And then I've written down all the, uh, well, the, the proofs you have from the sequent rules. 
And basically, then you can do, um, do proving linear formulas in lean. So I'm, I'm obscuring a bit here. I'm actually using like a different version of the sequence calculus that only has one sided sequence, but ignore that. You can basically then say, in order to prove this formula, like p um, par not p, in order to do that, I need to construct an element um, of lin proof of that type. So for each for, like sequent, I have a corresponding um, type lin proof that sequent. And in order to prove a formula, I have to construct an element of that type using the constructors I have at my disposal, which are the sequent rules. So for example, here, if I do this in tactic mode, you see that the first thing I have to do is it's just my goal. Oops, what's happening here? OK, so I can say I have h by init p. This gives me h, which is a lin proof of p, comma, and p dual. That's not quite what I want, uh, quite what I want yet. So um, then the next thing I have also g. So g is this complicated rule which turns the, the comma into a par. So you see here the problem is that there's somehow this empty sequent happening here, which is one, like a result from the, the way I define the rule. Because I have to allow for arbitrary context, here I'm saying, you know, take the empty context. But it's, as an artifact in, the, in lean, you know, it doesn't automatically reduce this empty thing. So I have to then at the next st step say, actually, you know, I want to get rid of these empty things using my axiom. So I'm re rewriting using the comma empty axiom. And now, basically, everything's in the right form. So I have this hypothesis h, which I get from the init rule. And I also have g, which is the rule that turns the sequent p comma p dual um, into the one with the par in between. And so now I'm just applying g to my uh, goal, which gives me the thing with a comma between. And now I can apply h. And that gives me a proof of the, basically the most basic linear logic proof you can get because if you write this down without you know using all the things that it's it's actually just like um, oops so first you use the, init, uh, the initial rule then you dualize and then you introduce the you use the introduction rule for par. So that's basically the proof. And here it's much more complicated because you have to keep track of all of these uh, conversions with the comma and so on. And I tried to prove a more, so this is a more complicated, this is linear distribution. So it's saying that you have a tensor and a par and you can somehow re-bracket. Um, and this is much more complicated because because of all the bracketings happening. So if you just look at what's happening in the context, so first I rewrite this implication uh, that was given uh, here. I rewrite it in terms of its definition. So I defined it in terms of this lambda function. Then I have to simplify in order to kind of plug everything in. But then you see the dual is still here on the outside. And now I use my dual function, which was defined in terms of the De Morgan dualities. I use this twice to sort of bring all the duals inside. And then I have to construct the sequence and everything is, is bad. Even here at the end, you see I've, I've done all this construction. And basically, so F, uh, I think, what is it? F is the right one. You see I have all of the ingredients that I need. So these are the ingredients that I need, but they're completely in the wrong order. And so basically I'd have to do like, I don't know, probably another six or seven like rewrite steps of using commutativity. And, and so, so we say sorry and call it a day. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>